Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to reintroduce to you now. Dr. Adrian Sotomoda is a returning guest on our show. Be sure to check out episode 138 of Boundless Body Radio, which was part of a special series we did featuring Dr. Nick Norwitz as the guest host. We've also hosted Dr. Sotomoda on episode 340 and on episode 419 of our show. Dr. Adrian Sotomoto is a medical doctor, a PhD, a specialist in internal medicine, and data science researcher at the Unidad de Investigación de Enfermedades Metabólicas. I tried. My Spanish is not as good as my it's, Portuguese. It's, it's Dr. Perfect. Sotomoto is passionate about studying low-carbohydrate and ketogenic diets and how they impact human metabolism. Dr. Sotomoto earned his MD from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México and earned his PhD at Oxford. He has created many resources to help people successfully implement a low carbohydrate diet and provides that help for both English and Spanish speaking individuals. He is the co-author of a 2022 paper titled The Lipid Energy Model, Reimagining Lipoprotein Function in the Context of Carbohydrate Restricted Diets, which was also co-authored by former guests, Dr. Nick Norwitz and Dave Feldman, who we hosted in episode 109 of Balanced Body Radio. Dr. Adrian Sotomoto, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you back to Balanced Body Radio. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be back. I'm always happy to. I mean, I've enjoyed all our conversations. And of course, I like talking about their research. So thank you for having me again. Well, it's such an honor to host you. You've got some new digs. You just moved into a new place in Mexico City. Looks great. Yeah. You've got lots of big, important looking books behind you. Um, and you said it's <laughs> a really kind of nice um, end of town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's. Uh, yeah, I mean, one of uh, the heaviest item uh, when moving places is definitely the book section. Okay. So yeah, it's this is one of many, but yeah, there are never enough, I guess. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, it's a good workout, if nothing else, right? Of course, of course. Of course. Uh, in the past, we have established very scientifically, very objective facts that that have been proven by science, such as Mexican food is the best on the planet. Objectively, that is true. Churros are the best dessert you could ever have. That is objectively <laughs> true. Uh, the, the Mexican Grand Prix is amazing. That is objectively true. So anyway, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to um, another great conversation with you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to it as well. Very scientific. Um, so I mentioned Dr. Nick Norwitz in the introduction. Obviously, he went to school with you. You guys are very good friends. Um, we've got to have a few conversations with him over the years. And he has made a bit of a splash recently in this whole... Um, Kind of, kind of world of, of the lipid energy model that you, of course, know very well and you've contributed amazing research to. And he has come up with a very kind of provocative kind of an experiment to show, um, you know, how to control high cholesterol levels, if, if I can say it that way. And, and the way he did it is he, he designed a trial that I thought was pretty well designed where he showed that he could lower his cholesterol more eating Oreo cookies than he could by taking a statin. And he did that just to kind of prove a point and hopefully move a conversation forward. And hopefully eventually we'll get him on to be able to talk about that experience. But this is obviously this is something that's very near and dear to your heart. So you would be, I think, really um, interesting to talk to about the situation. Can you tell us a little bit more about what he did? Uh, sure. In this last experiment, what he did was that uh, he kept his usual diet, which is a ketogenic diet. Uh, recorded his cholesterol, which, I mean, uh, is very high as he is very lean, and then evaluated what would happen to the concentration of LDL if you introduce 100 grams a day of even the lousiest possible version of carbohydrates, which is Oreo cookies. I mean, perhaps you can come up with even worse versions than that. Uh, but anyway, the point is that uh, he was looking for something notorious, so to speak, or something that would raise eyebrows. No one would think Oreo cookies could be a treatment for this epidemia. And of course, they aren't. This was just to prove a point that carbs by themselves are a very strong regulator of the LDL response. And... Then recorded his LDL uh, during this uh, Oreo phase. Then there was a washout period. And then he went back to the ketogenic diet. Cholesterol went up again, actually a tiny bit higher than during the first phase, over 500. And then used 
the high dose of the most potent statin, which is rosuvastatin, it's perhaps one of the most famous, if not the most famous medication for lowering for lowering cholesterol. And the cholesterol came down again as, ex as expected, but certainly not as much as with Aria cookies. And this was to prove a point, I mean, of course, the point of this intervention is not to say that if you have dyslipidemia, you should eat Oreo cookies. I mean, that couldn't be further from the truth. The point is that you can pick pretty much any source of carbs and the LDL response in someone lean, restricting carbohydrates will be dramatic which is of course consistent with what with other studies that we've published so far. Um, one of the case reports um, compared, for example, MUFA and PUFA, uh, different compositions in the diet. Uh, Nick also a while ago, I think, uh, went for a while on a vegan ketogenic diet or a vegetarian ketogenic diet. Yeah, it was vegan ketogenic diet because Vegetables don't have cholesterol. The membranes are use a uh, similar but different molecule, ergosterol. Uh, so being cholesterol less, you cannot attribute cholesterol changes to your intake. So even a, a ketogenic diet without cholesterol also raises cholesterol. And it, this is also in line with what we reported in the first LMHR paper in the current developments in nutrition paper, where there is a case series from Tro Caldian's uh, clinic in which six patients have very large elevations of LDL during carbohydrate restriction, but also very large uh, reductions in LDL when they incorporate even a little bit of carbohydrates. So this is, you could say that this is an argument that tries to make a point using an extreme scenario. And, and it looks to highlight the mechanism we think explains both things. We think that what explains why lean people have so massive LDL increments when they restrict carbohydrates is the same thing that explains why LDL goes down so quickly when they introduce um, when they introduce a small amount of carbohydrates, regardless of the quality of these carbohydrates. And this explanation is the lipid energy model, which in a nutshell proposes that if you have low peripheral reserves of fat, in other words, if you're lean and your energy demand is high, there is extra pressure on your liver to re redistribute the fat that arrives and the fat that's around. And this is translated into a high VLDL excretion from the liver and it's very rapid conversion by lipoprotein lipase into LDL. And LDL accumulates because LDL has a longer life than other lipoparticles. And that's what explains uh, why it goes up. When you remove this pressure on the liver to export very low density lipoproteins by consuming a tiny amount of carbs, now you have glycogen to export. You don't need to export as much VLDL. So that also explains that within a few days, your LDL comes down. And some of the predictions of the lipid energy model have already been uh, independently observed, as in other data sets different from the one we used for, for the CBN paper. Some remain to be tested, and we're working and testing them uh, right now. But that's, in a nutshell, uh, the point that the Oreo cookie experiment is trying to emphasize. Yeah, thank you for explaining that and for explaining the lipid energy model. The thing I find fascinating is if you would have explained all of this, I don't know, five, six years ago, I would have thought this whole thing was ridiculous. I, I could have told you hardly anything that would have happened, but I, 
Yeah. I, I wouldn't have said that that would have been relevant at all to cholesterol, adding more carbohydrates, and especially the worst. As you say, like probably we can all agree that's a, not the best carbohydrate source that you could be eating as a bunch of Oreos. The, the thing that is fascinating to me is I don't think anybody who is familiar with this model was surprised by the results. I was not surprised at all what the results were going to be. If the model were correct, if I understand each steps in the each step in the model, then this outcome would be it would punch you in the face. Like there's no other outcome that you would expect unless there's some type of a paradox, as people say, which really just means you need to go back and take a look at your hypothesis and keep reworking it until you you can explain it. But but that's the striking thing to me. I don't think anybody in this world who's heard of this and understands it well was surprised by the results. Were you surprised by the results? Oh, it's really not. Actually, we ran a small bet on who would win. And yeah, I mean, not surprised. Uh, I wasn't surprised by the results. I think this fulfilled the expectations of most people familiarized with, with the Olympic energy model. And perhaps something that I would add is that you can always say that this is just an n equal ones experiment you know like okay what if nick comes from another planet and he has a set of mutations that are unique to his condition and therefore not uh, we, we can't make extrapolations from this however this fits very well with what we found in other data sets so it's it's decreasingly possible that you can explain Nick's Oreo result with Nick's intrinsic individualities or peculiarities as a human being. So, um, I mean, what is more likely that this is a physiological mechanism with surely varying degrees of influence in different people. I mean, of course, some... Uh, interpersonal variability is expected, but uh, is this normal physiology or that Nick happens to inherit alien lipid metabolism genes that make his condition unique? I mean, that's that's very unlikely. And the fact that other groups, not necessarily who have collaborated with us, have reported similar uh, similar observations and also the fact that we, when we systematically reviewed randomized control trials of people who weren't self-allocating themselves to have a guide with restriction and who weren't uh, measuring their LDL or reporting their lipid panel, uh, we observed the same thing happening. I mean, if you are lean, your LDL goes up. If you are not lean and you have actually an, an excess of fat storage, peripheral fat storage, your LDL actually comes down. And if you are in the middle, your LDL stays pretty much the same or doesn't suffer from relevant changes. So um, I think that changing uh, hypothesis requires different forms of arguments. There is there is value in having extreme arguments or extreme points like the Oreo result. But there's also value in having independent corroborations, other people observing similar things. And there's also value of uh, showing the, the, you could say that a mix in between. I mean, the other paper that recently came out that was, a, was a collaboration with the University of Westminster, with the physiological human lab at the University of Westminster, and which stemmed out from Isabella Cooper doctoral thesis. I mean, we, we were part of that analysis, but the idea, the data was produced by, independently by another group and also uh, reports results in line. Well, yeah, that certainly decreased how surprised we were from seeing Oreo cookies beating the high dose of a high potency statin. It's okay. So again, it's fascinating to me. It wasn't surprising to me. I was trying to explain this 
to one of my clients recently, there's kind of a difference between expected results and unexpected results. So for example, this client who I've got, I've been training him for a while. He's, he's rolling now. He's starting to buy into nutrition. He is, is tightening up his diet. He's making changes. He's cutting a lot of sugar out of his diet and he's doing really well. And so he explained the first few days, my head, I've got a headache. I feel flat. I don't have very good energy. This kind of sucks. A few days later, it was like, um, I, I'm thinking a little bit more clearly. My sleep is less. Like I, I don't feel tired during the day, but I'm not sleeping as much. And now my joints are feeling much, much better. And I'm listening to all of this and thinking like, I'm, I expect all of those results at this point. I've heard this story so many times. I've gone through it myself. Those are things that I expect. If he had said, I, I tried changing my diet and my arm turned green. That would be an unexpected result. I would not assume that would happen. And if so, there may be multiple explanations for why his arm is green besides just changing the diet. But I think it's so much stronger when, again, if you understand the model, you are expecting those results to happen. And it's just the evidence is getting stronger and stronger, it seems like. I, I agree. I mean, as I said, as I alluded earlier, not all hypotheses have been confirmed. For example, uh, one we are uh, working on producing data at the moment is what we uh, named the gym hypothesis. And can you induce this phenotype on someone by controlling their their energy expenditure, basically by observing them uh, exercise more? Uh, the prediction would be that for a lean person restricting carbohydrates, LDL would be even higher if they increment their exercise activity or their 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 yeah their, their the amount of energy they spend every day. That would be one prediction. Uh, another hypothesis that we published in in the LAM review and hypothesis paper uh, is, for example, the role of NGPTL, the NGPTL family. Another role that hasn't been explored yet is, for example, APOC3. Another hypothesis is that, I mean, there are other things that have, uh, I mean, yet to be directly measured or tested, but so far, yeah, I mean, there is converging evidence and observations on that, at least to the main statements or the main hypothesis of the lipid energy model uh, hold, holds true. For example, there is some, this is worth mentioning. I mean, there is some some alternative hypotheses or possible explanations uh, people came uh, came up with or or put forward uh, for the Oreo experiment. For example, one of them is that insulin. Uh, we know already that insulin is a strong regulator and has a a, a strong influence on the activity of LDL receptor. So one of the hypotheses was that uh, LDL coming down is more a response of insulin uh, or is more directly attributable to insulin going up when you introduce carbohydrates and this increases the activity of the receptor of, of LDL in the liver and increases its clearance. This is of course a valid plausible and I would say even well-formulated hypothesis. We didn't observe an association with insulin markers or insulin itself in the study with uh, the University of Westminster. Um, at the same time, it would be hard to tease out this special effect because you would need to be able to manipulate either the activity of the LDL receptor or the changes in insulin if you introduce carbohydrates. So that particular physiological mechanism may be harder to, to explore. However, perhaps the most important or pragmatic point of view holds true. If you introduce a tiny amount of carbohydrates, your LDL would come down. Interesting. Okay, so for the person who's listening and has maybe never heard of some of this stuff, they're hearing you say LDL, we're talking about cholesterol. People assume that cholesterol is bad. Can we talk about the relevance of this information? Why this is so important? I, 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 there, there's people in this community, some who I know personally who are probably listening to this episode who fit this phenotype, we'll call it. So they, they start low carbohydrate, 
what we call bad cholesterol skyrockets. Um, the good cholesterol is in a really, really good range and triglycerides drop, which is also very, very good. But we have this big concerning thing with LDL and it puts people in a pretty tight space based on traditional information that we have about cholesterol in particular, what we know about LDL cholesterol. So can you explain why this is so important and what possible implications could come from this in the future? Sure. I mean, LDL matters because there is a ton of data and evidence suggesting it's a strong cardiovascular risk factor. Even when some people dispute uh, the causal role LDL plays in the development of cholesterol plaques around the arteries in your heart and in your brain and causing strokes and, and myocardial infarctions. Um, we should say that we've never implied so far that LDL does not matter. I mean, we're typically, we are typically framed in social media or, or, yeah, I mean, some people who, well, I mean, I have no reasons to believe they are not well-intended. I think they are perhaps, they just haven't read what we've published so far carefully. Um, we've never said LDL does not matter. I mean, we've never said that it's perfectly safe to be uh, walking around for years with an LDL above 400 or 500, or we've never denied LDL is a marker of increased cardiovascular, cardiovascular risk. However, we definitely, we've definitely, we've definitely said that as always, cardiovascular risk needs to be personalized. It's a conversation between a patient and their healthcare provider. Let me put an example. Um, Nick is someone who has been privileged enough to be mostly healthy. I mean, yeah, you could say that living with uh, inflammatory bowel disease is not necessarily healthy, but I mean, but besides that, besides that, um, he's cardiovascular healthy. He's someone who has had the cardiovascular endurance to actually participate in different forms of, of high intensity sport. He has been cardiovascular healthy. He started the ketogenic diet with clean coronaries. And he started uh, living with a high LDL not so long ago. I mean, years already, but not so long ago. His risk profile is surely different from someone who engaged with a ketogenic diet after having a heart attack, for example. It's totally different to, to it's perhaps totally different. Uh, we don't know that for sure yet, but it's perhaps a little different to start walking around with an LDL of 500 after already having a heart attack, one stent, and lots of cholesterol in your coronaries. Do we have reasons to believe those are different scenarios, risk-wise? Uh, yeah, we do have reasons to believe those are different scenarios. Um, do we know to what extent? No, we don't. And something that needs to be understood about risk ratios is that they matter a lot for people with high baseline risk, and they matter significantly less for people with low baseline risk. So let's say that LDL, that it holds true, that LDL elevates your risk of having a heart attack uh, linearly. I mean, this is an exaggeration. We, we actually think it's not like that. Let's say it raises your risk of having a heart attack by twofold. Well, if your baseline risk was 0 0.05, now your risk is of 0 0.1. But if your baseline risk was of 10%, now it's 20%. So that's what I mean when I say that the same risk factor matters differently for different people. LMHRs are people typically without other classic cardiovascular risk factors. 
they are lean, they exercise, they have normal blood pressure, they have uh, typical, they rarely smoke, they rarely, um, so in other words, they are typically a low baseline risk population. Does this mean that LDL does not matter if you're in LMHR? We don't know yet. I mean, perhaps the best data possible will come from Matthew Budoff's paper. Uh, he already he already published uh, preliminary results of the case matching analysis they made with Miami cohort. And so far, in their with their data, which includes people, uh, I mean, with a mean age of 55 years old and who have uh, twice as much LDL than the Miami counterparts, um, there doesn't seem to be an association with, with uh, cardiovascular risk, or at least with the amount of plaque you have in your coronaries with state-of-the-art cardiac imaging. That's that's the best data that we will have soon enough. Let's say that in the end it turns out yes, LDL is still a cardiovascular risk factor if you are an LMHR, even when you are lean, have normal blood pressure, don't smoke, and et cetera, et cetera. The lipid energy model or the advantage of understanding and making sure the predictions of the lipid energy model are correct is that we could actually know how to treat that high or that risk of LDL by simply giving you a small amount of carbs. Sure. So, so th that's, that's the difference between predictions and mechanistic explanations. I mean, not so long ago, one of my favorite teachers during my PhD, Alan Garfinkel, he, he's at UCLA, tweeted, if you want predictions, go with an astrologer. The purpose of science is causal explanations. Sure, I mean, I'm not saying predictions are meaningless or worthless. It's useful to know what's your predicted risk of cardiovascular disease. But it's even more useful to know why it went up and how it comes down. Because then you don't need to wait for the scientific debates to settle. You, If, if you are someone who can have a small amount of healthier than Oreos carbs, Perhaps if you're not using a ketogenic diet because you have severe epilepsy, or if you're not using a ketogenic diet for other more stringent reasons, now you have a good insight of how you can control that risk factor regardless of its magnitude. And let me emphasize its relevance is expected to be small because of your low baseline risk, even better than with the high dose of the most potent statin. So that's why it's useful to have explanations, not only predictions. I think that, sure, let's go for, for let's do our best to get our most accurate and precise estimate of how much LDL raises cardiovascular risk. We should do that. Despite, the, I mean, it's actually harder than, than, than it seems. But the real power and perhaps the most actionable insights from, from science come from having the explanation of why it went up, how it can come down, who is at risk and who is not. And I mean, just to, to stop, as a final point, I would say that the larger relevance, if not the largest relevance, is that most people who engage with a ketogenic diet do not have a high BMI. So the real relevance or the most significant relevance of these ideas is that the majority of people engaging with a ketogenic diet actually are not expected to have these very large LDL changes. And they are, by engaging with a ketogenic diet or with fasting, improving other even more important cardiovascular risk factors, such as insulin resistance, such as hypertension, obesity. I mean, carbohydrate restriction already beat it, the DASH diet for hypertension in a randomized controlled trial. Uh, it's fantastic for insulin sensitivity. So the larger relevance is the reassurance that most people engaging with carbohydrate restriction are not expected to be in this scenario. Mm. Yeah. 
I'm glad you pointed that out. That's a, an important thing to remember. And and again, based on traditional models of what we think of fat, in particular saturated fat and and cholesterol that we consume, we 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 eat the cholesterol. It gets into our bodies. It works the way that grease works in a drain and just starts to kind of plug things up and clog arteries. I hear that term all the time, clogging arteries. And and you see these numbers too, right? Like 100 LDL or 130 LDL. Maybe that goes up to 500 LDL. Like that sounds like such a huge number. But as I understand it, the volume of cholesterol in your blood is minuscule. Is that right? Yes, it's right. In the end, the concentration of cholesterol you care about, more, more, more specifically, the location of cholesterol you care about is around your arteries, not necessarily in your bloodstream, which is, of course, highly correlated with how much of it gets to your coronaries. I mean, but it's certainly more important its location in your coronaries than in your plate. Um, actually, perhaps one of the most, uh, one of the strongest points of evidence um, is a study published in 2019 by Haid et al., Jeff, Jeff Bollock's lab, where they decreased and increased the amount of saturated fat in the diet. And very convincingly, mechanistically showed how the amount of cholesterol you eat, the amount of saturated fat you eat, does not necessarily correlate with how much circulating cholesterol, well, LDL you have in your, in your arteries. Um, most of the cholesterol is endogenously produced. It's so important that it's not even an option to, to produce it. And we know that, especially for Insulin sensitive people, insulin sensitive lean people, the amount of cholesterol you eat or, or of saturated fat you eat does not necessarily cause a larger amount of saturate, circulating saturated fat. So, in a nutshell, what I would say is that it's not only about how much cholesterol you have circulating. It's all about how much cholesterol you have around your brain's arteries and your coronaries. And the amount of cholesterol that ends up there is not necessarily a linear function of how much cholesterol you have in your bloodstream or necessarily a linear function of how much cholesterol there is in your plate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for clarifying, clarifying that. Maybe this would be a good time to go into some of a, a little bit of that study that you mentioned, um, and and remind me of the doctor's name who's doing it. He's working with Dave Feldman to to get this data out. What was his name? Matthew Budov. Okay, so he's at so, the Lundquist Institute uh, and UCLA, and he presented in November last year eighty uh, patients from the LMHR study. They are conducting prospective study. They are conducting. Uh, it's 80 and not 100 because some of the participants were not age eligible to be matched with the Miami Heart cohort. And they basically found the closest match to these 80 LMHR patients in the Miami, in the Miami cohort. And they did a fantastic job of matching them. I mean, they matched age, uh, tobacco consumption status, uh, they also matched hypertension status. They also, I mean, they match all the other things that we know influence how much plague you have in your coronaries. And they did a great job in making that the only difference between these two groups is how much circulating LDL you, you've had. Um, and with their data, there doesn't seem to be an association of how much circulating LDL you have and how much plaque there is in your arteries. So, uh, again, uh, perhaps the, the strongest point will come from their perspective study from these hundreds of LMHRs followed over the years uh, with uh, dietary records, with corroboration of ketosis, with an extended lipid panel, and with state-of-the-art cardiac imaging, seeing if cholesterol went up or not. So if cholesterol around their arteries went up or not. Um, it's, I mean, it's... It's expected this year, 
and hopefully we will have good data to 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 better answer that question. Yeah. So I was in the room at Low Carb Denver uh, 2023 when the very preliminary data was released, and this was basically we we have collected the first set of data. This is our starting point. So this really doesn't tell you how this is going to go. So like you said, over time, we're going to continue looking at this group, maybe a year where I'm expecting that data any, any day, any week. Um, you know, maybe I don't know how long they're planning on going, but if they go two years and four years and six years and 10 years, whatever, however long they go is great. But what you had when you released the, the original data, preliminary data, we measured 100 people, 100% of 100 people had hypercholesterolemia. So they all had cholesterol that was very, very high. They all had very, very high LDL cholesterol. Do you remember what the average was? Was it 259? Yeah, it was around 250 to 60. Certainly, okay. I mean, twice as much as the control arm and comparable to what you would have observed in, for example, familiar hypercholesterolemia. Yep. So that's, which is also another population of, another relevant population of, for comparisons, because we know that people with FH can have heart attacks within years. Yep. So if you don't observe these heart attacks or this much more plague in this population, then you need to answer why you have them in one population, but not in the other. Right. Because their LDL concentrations are comparable. Yep. And, and so FH being a genetic disease that is yeah. more yeah. fatal early in life with heart disease, but it does seem like if you if you survive past age 40 or 50, it seems like your survival rates are actually much better than other people. And you also seem to be protected from things like cancers. There's lower prevalences of other diseases, which is quite interesting that if, if you can get past that really high risk time in early life, you'll, you, you may have some protection from more circulating cholesterol. Mm -hmm. But again, that's a genetic disease. That's a totally different mechanism that's not the same as as this cohort of people right did they confirm that these hundred people were were there any cases of familiar hypercholesterolemia that you know of oh yeah i mean they they, they that's one of their exclusion criteria okay and and yeah it's also i mean it's worth mentioning um in the case series we reported in the cdn paper those participants also uh i mean have screening that I mean genetics some of those participants also had screening testing for FH and they didn't have any of the known genes. You could always say that there are uh perhaps undiscovered genes for FH, but I mean it's decreasingly likely and again it's just unlikely that every single LMHR has a hidden genetic mutation we haven't discovered, you know? Okay. So so yeah, if I am correct, I mean, I'm almost sure, but but uh, if I am correct, they, I mean, FH is one of the exclusion criteria, which it should have been. It, I I would expect sure. that as well. It should have been because that's a yeah, again yeah. a different mechanism. So I'm pretty much people, sure. Yes. Okay, okay. I I thought it was too. Hundred people, sixty of them are male, I believe. Forty of them are female. Yeah. Um, and and, and the ages, I want to say, were also mid fifties. Is that about right? Yeah, 55, if I remember correctly. It's the okay. mean age. Standard deviation should be around seven years or so, six, yeah. seven years. These are and all people that have... Oh, go ahead. Again, I mean, uh, I think this is worth emphasizing because they are not Nick. They are not a 25-year-old who started a ketogenic diet with a clean coronary artery, you know? I mean, with a clean coronary. They are... Some of them smoked. Some of them... Uh, you know, so uh, they are not Nick. You could always say that uh, Nick's case is not comparable because not everyone started a ketogenic diet being lean and cardiovascularly healthy. Um, Matthew Budov's data is closer to the clinical question we have in our offices because it's a population aged 55 years old or so, with other lifestyle factors. And I mean, I, 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 I take every opportunity to remind everyone that age is perhaps the strongest cardiovascular risk factor. I mean, the, the one no one will challenge, the one no one will question is the role age has on cardiovascular disease. 
So just by breathing another day, you are raising your cardiovascular risk. Yep. And yep. and uh, that's why I think it's worth emphasizing that a Matthew boot of Zeta uh, doesn't look like Nick, which is fantastic. Which is fantastic. Dude, this is prime time, dude. That this is the group of people who you would be the most concerned about, mostly male, middle-aged, super high cholesterol, other risk factors, like you mentioned, were, were part of some people's cases, but it was kind of a mix of all of them. And they've been eating, all of them, I think the average age on a ketogenic diet was four and a half years or something like that. So you assume they're eating lots of saturated fat. Now, the, this particular study is done by, like you said, taking images of, of, of different areas in the arteries that is far more sophisticated. So like you mentioned earlier, they're circulating cholesterol, which they had a lot of, but if we're right about that part doesn't matter as much as where it is and where it's getting deposited, here is a great way to test those two things. It, it, there must be accumulations in different places. And I want to say this study looked at nine different places and there's a possible score of three yeah. in each location. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, Matthew Budov would be the, the person to ask this. Um, I hope I am not uh, destroying the the explanation but you want to know how much cholesterol there is but also you want to know where it is because i mean there's no benign location in your coronaries where it's okay to have cholesterol but there are certainly some places that are worse than others and some places that are more prone to have cholesterol plays than others um that's why they look at the different segments of the coronary circulation. And that's why they're not only analyzing the total amount of cholesterol they observe, they are also analyzing, they're, they're, they have a score where depending of how much cholesterol you have in one segment, but also which other segments are affected, uh, wh which yields the, the, the primary endpoint comparison. So I think that, and, and again, I mean, Matthew Budov, already was a legend and a very respected uh, researcher in cardiovascular imaging, especially in this particular technique. So this is the way uh, research in that field compares plaque. It's pretty much the same standard that is used for other studies, comparing how much cholesterol and where it is, the one he and his team is using for this particular data set. Okay, perfect. I, I appreciate that. I know we weren't really expecting to talk about this, but this is so exciting and so relevant to what we're talking about. Again, preliminary data. I don't know what the data was five years ago, 10 years ago. You could, you could never say it. that wasn't collected. We don't know. This is just from, from the starting point, from what we knew about these people, all those factors that we talked about, there were zero people that had a score in the double digits. Every person had a score in the single digits. I want to say it was not, not a three point, but I think it was a five point in nine different locations. So so the, the maximum score you could get would be 45. Nobody had a single score in the double digits and a, and a majority of people had a zero score. Yeah. Dude, the place, like you heard the gasp and then you could hear a pin drop. I was blown away. Sure. I mean, that observation is very hard to explain within the usual explanations for LDL and cardiovascular risk. Again, this is not saying that LDL doesn't matter. This is not saying that, I mean, you can have basically a coronary full with cholesterol. You go on keto for one week. You shouldn't expect your cardiovascular risk to be low, you know? That's right. And, and, However, that observation in such a well-controlled setting is very hard to explain within the traditional or using the traditional mechanisms for, for LDL because their imaging is state-of-the-art, their follow-up practices are also state-of-the-art, and it's not something you wouldn't expect that amount of single digit and zero scores from that population, from a 55 year old 
person with an over 200 LDL cholesterol. Yep. And yeah, so all of this is just so fascinating. And like you said, this this would be very difficult to explain in the kind of classical traditional way of us understanding cardiology and in particular cholesterol. But but it's like what Nick is doing, a provocative kind of a, an experiment, end of one, but it's well done. And this is starting to force the conversation. Now, I've heard a lot of people that are followed out there, traditional kind of cardiologists that subscribe to, you know, lower cholesterol, lower cholesterol at all costs. It's a time sensitive thing. Anyway, <laughs> again, potential implications of this shifting our thinking around procedures, medications, recommendations, dietary recommendations. I mean, where where does the list end of things that we may one day be able to say this this changes everything does it not yeah it's it's it changes it changes a lot of things um perhaps i mean there are public health implications that are private one to one consult implications that are uh, physiological and purely academic implications. However, what I would say is that some people will never change their mind. I mean, it's not everyone is convinced by facts. And sometimes, for example, I've been asked why those things haven't changed already. Why there are people that still ascribe to lower is always better and why people uh, keep or, or, or remain unconvinced by, by the data that has been produced during the last years. Not everyone is convinced by facts. Uh, at the same time, and of course, this is th there is there isn't a, a research setting that is perfect. There is there is no such thing as a perfect study. Everyone does their best we're producing uh, sound analysis. This is increasingly convincing. And at the same time, I, I think that all the ramifications and implications of these challenges to the classic view of LDL as a cardiovascular risk factor will take time. Won't necessarily be achieved by more papers. And perhaps if I had to pick one, I would like to emphasize is what I would I would hope to achieve is a change in most of my colleagues' mindset about which interventions try first. Let's say we are genuinely worried by someone's LDL in this setting. Well, then. The Oreo experiment or uh, the K series or our meta analysis suggests why don't you try diet first? I mean, it's it's people have to eat anyway, you know, and and it's an intervention. Why don't you give that a shot first? And I think that if we achieve these mindsets in 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 a lot of colleagues, all healthcare, not necessarily cardiovascular risk-related healthcare, would improve. I do believe there is there is this uh, sign outside a doctor's office that I repeatedly see on different platforms that if your doctors if your doctor writes you a drug prescription without having first asked about your sleep habits, your diet, your exercise activity. Perhaps you don't have a doctor, you have something closer to a drug dealer. To be fair, a lot of doctors in different parts of the world are super strained and have too many patients in, have to see too many patients in a very short time frame. But then what we should change is those time frames. What we should change is a health system that allows doctors enough time to inquire about lifestyle and to, to allow them enough time to explain how to implement lifestyle changes um, before perhaps trying a drug. 
Last week, I saw a patient in my office um, who was interested in longevity and in improving not only lifespan, but health span. And after talking with him, I mean, he had a very uh, healthy lifestyle. He, had, he exercised, he was mentally active, his diet was okay. Even when he wasn't trying to, he was pretty much practicing 60 to 8, the 60 to 8 version of intermittent fasting. But his sleep was not okay. He snored, he had apneas. His wife said he had apneas. Uh, he had problems sleeping. And even patients sometimes look first for a supplement solution or a drug or a prescription solution. And if good sleep was, if we could gather good sleep in a pill, it would be the best longevity supplement you could find. I mean, you could, and actually, I mean, sleep is also related, of course, with insulin sensitivity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, what I would hope is that these challenges to uh, fairly established and unchallenged paradigm in healthcare triggers this change in mindset that inquire about lifestyle first, try lifestyle changes first. They are typically safer than a drug. They are typically cheaper than a drug. People have to make lifestyle decisions anyway. And perhaps the reason we are not using them is because we are just more comfortable either writing or receiving prescriptions that take 30 seconds to write instead of actually investing and allowing time for doctors to inquire about lifestyle and uh, explaining how to implement lifestyle changes. This is not only true for cardiovascular disease. I mean, this is true for uh, not too long ago, I had also had a patient uh, whose main sleep challenge was the fact that she drank pretty much 1.5 liters before going to bed. So of course her sleep was interrupted two or three times just to go and urinate. And a very simple rule, you know, of don't drink that much liquid before you go to bed improved one of the most important sources of influence in all health, not only cardiovascular risk, you know? I mean, poor sleep has been linked with cancer. There are some studies that, that show that your NK lymphocytes don't work as well after a night of insomnia. So what I would, the implication I would love to see is a change of mindset about how much we inquire, how much value we assign to lifestyle and how much value we allow ourselves to try lifestyle changes. And I couldn't agree more. And it's so interesting that this population is asking, forcing the hand, forcing new questions and finding new information where we knew how much vitamin C you needed. That may or may not be the case on a low carbohydrate diet, how much cholesterol affects your risk factors for different things. And I'll, I'll just say, again, this is anecdote, but when I go to conferences and somebody like Dr. Sean Baker will come up to the stage and say, everybody raise your hand and stay like, Let's say we we think we're on the right path with the lipid energy model. We think we eventually might be able to show that LDL cholesterol may not be the, the, the harm that we think it is. What if we're wrong? How many of you are willing to get off of this diet to maybe lower your risk of a heart attack? And and dude, it's it's 95, 96%. I don't know. Nobody puts their hand down. Hardly anybody puts their hand down when asked that question because of all the other things you listed. Like, yes, heart attacks are one thing, but when you improve your quality of life, you have more energy, you are sleeping better, you're even more efficient with your sleep and you have more time during the day to do things. There's so many other benefits that people are not willing to walk away from once they do, like you said, and start to address the lifestyle first. It's like, I don't, really care if I keel over tomorrow with a heart attack because my life is so much better today. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, this, this reminded me to 
uh, two different interactions uh, over X after after one of her papers. One of them was about is LDL always a harmful thing? And I mean, this was more about you could say, yeah, I mean, certainly physiology and more about the the you could even say uh, philosophy of nature. But one of the examples was, okay, is, is blood pressure, high blood pressure, very sound cardiovascular risk factor. Is high blood pressure ever okay? Well, I mean, in exercise, sure. Um, does this mean high blood pressure does not matter? No. However, perhaps one of the points we're trying to say here is that the fact that People who randomly were assigned to carbohydrate restriction show this response, suggests that this is perhaps a naturally occurring normal physiology response. And something we know about other potentially harmful adaptations is that they very frequently come with compensation mechanisms to mitigate that, that harm. So when your blood pressure goes up, when you're doing exercise, there are other things that happen in your body your renal excretion of salt, the distensibility of your lungs. I mean, other things happen to mitigate the potential harms. When you're fighting off a disease, an inflammation, which is also an adaptive but potentially harmful thing, there are, I mean, nature evolved these parallel mechanisms designed to mitigate the potential harm of this adaptive but potentially harmful thing. There's no reason to believe similar things should happen for LDL. Sure, LDL may be harmful in most cases in today's world. However, it's not unreasonable to think that people overall healthy implement parallel mechanisms that mitigate the potential harm by L circulating LDL could have. So that's on one thing. And then on the other, you made me uh, remember something I heard for the first time from Sarah Halberg, that perhaps, I mean, this is only speaking from a doctor's office point of view. I mean, the point of view from a decision maker is different. The point of view from a science divulgator is different. But thinking only from the point of view of uh, individual doctor's office, there will always be people who reject what you're proposing them. I mean, of course, I have patients who reject the ketogenic diet and who say, no, that's not for me. I love breath too much. I want to try something different. I mean, that, that happens. And the same thing will happen with people on a ketogenic diet. There will always be people who say, I don't want to, I, I don't want to be off this diet. I don't want to risk it. And they, they, they don't need to give us explanations actually about that. It's, we should be respectful of their personal preferences in the same way we are respectful of someone who doesn't want to quit bread, but we are still morally obliged to do our best to help them and help them improve their life. There will always be people who say, even if this is a high cardiovascular risk factor, I don't want to be off of this diet because I feel it has, I mean, it brings different forms of benefits to my, to my life. And we should also have an answer for them. Um, to me, it increasingly looks like, like that answer is, yeah, maybe there are parallel mechanisms that mitigate the harms of high circulating LDL that we observe in other people. We definitely observe them in other people. Um, yes, even if this is a high risk factor, as I said, even if it doubles your, your cardiovascular risk factor, if your baseline is low, well, doubling a low baseline is not that hard. Uh, and we are simply providing the information we should give people so they make their informed decisions according with their hierarchy of values. And we need data to do that. And we should be mindful that there will always be people who will reject whatever we do. And that's why Sarah Halberg used to say, I mean, perhaps there is nothing will beat an N equals one study where the n and the equals one means you. I can do nothing if my, if my patient comes back 
in their next appointment and say, I hate life on a ketogenic diet. I don't think this is working for me. Well, it doesn't matter. I could have 10, 30 year long randomized control trials. It doesn't matter for my patient. I mean, that that his preference and his experience through what I recommended is more relevant than 30 randomized clinical trials with convergent systematic reviews. It's pointless. The, the, what matters is the N equals one experience of this particular person. And that's also why I think that everyone, I mean, doctors and patients should be open to the idea of, I need to find out what works for me. And in that mindset, try lifestyle first. Oh my goodness. That's such a great explanation. Dr. Sotomoto, we've been talking for over an hour. We didn't cover an entire paper that we wanted to talk about today. I was so excited to talk to you about um, with Christopher Gardner uh, getting a lot of the spotlight now with the twin study and all this information. I know how busy you are. I hate asking, but is there any way you would like to come back on and we can address sure, your sure. work with diet trends, man? Uh, I know sure. <laughs> slammed and doing so much great work. I, it, this conversation is fascinating. And I, like you, I believe it's very relevant. I, there are people that I know that are making very difficult lifestyle decisions every single day based on these numbers. And the quicker this information gets out there, the, the better it's going to help people. And your ability to explain things, be scientific, be willing to change your mind, change hypotheses. If that be the case, I, it's, it's so impressive. I absolutely love chatting to you. This has been such a fun conversation. Where would you like people to go to find you and connect with you in your work? Uh, in X, I am at Adrian Sotomota altogether. Adrian, S-O-T-O-M-O-T-A. And yeah, that's, that's a good way to find me whenever we have something else to share and publish something. It's there. And yeah, that's a good place. That's awesome. That's super easy. Dr. Sotomoto, like I said, it's such a joy to chat with you. And thank you so very much for all of your tireless work and all the questions you're coming up with and ways to design studies. It's just, it's so impressive and it's very, very relevant. And I, I just, I can see a world sometime in the future where this, this is changing whole paradigms and entire business models and systems and all kinds of stuff. So thank you again so very much for all your work. And thank you for taking the time to be on our show today. We really appreciate it. Thank you it. for having me. And thank you to your everyone in your audience for their time and interest. Absolutely. And this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio.